Hey, Geekscapists, welcome to a brand new Geekscape podcast. I'm Jonathan London, your host. And if this is your first Geekscape, strap yourselves in for some pop culture talk movies, video games, comic books, TV, all of the pop culture talk that you can fit under a hood in about an hour. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. That new Last of Us show premiered on HBO. You've been waiting on that one for a while, right? You played the video game, you got yourself caught up. Uh, if only to tell people, well, the game is better. For whatever reasons you had to watch it or play the game, you did it. And uh, I thought the movie, I thought the show was great. Uh, we got tons of uh, talk about that. Also, uh, my good friend Tom Merritt, he's a tech journalist. You may remember him as a radio host way back, old school tech TV. Um, he is still talking tech. He's talking tech all the time. Tech is like his thing. He went to CES. He covers all that stuff. We're going to be talking AI. One of the things that really gets me is uh, towards the end of the year, everybody started doing those AI photos of themselves um, where they would take the app and they would do the AI renditions, uh, everything but the hand, right? Like, did you see the hands on them? They look like crab people. Uh, that was a lot going on there towards the end of the year. I don't know what you people needed. I didn't. I don't know what you needed to be told. I don't. I don't know what you needed uh, emotionally, that you went and did a hundred versions of yourselves on AI. And I definitely don't know what you sacrificed um, as far as uh, giving out your information in order to do so. But I hope you got what you needed. I hope that uh, you feel good about those pictures. I hope you feel good about the reaction you got on social media when you shared the pictures. You know, we're here for such a short amount of time. Then the robots will take over. And luckily, you've already told the robots uh, how to replicate you and what to look like. We're going to talk about all that stuff with Tom. Uh, also, I got, I got to say this. Uh, you know, I like the Talking Animals movies. You know, any movie with an animal in it, you know, Jonathan's there. Uh, <laughs> they're like, wait, last episode, didn't you talk about almost fighting a monkey in Thailand? Yes, I did. It doesn't mean I won't defend my wife from a, an animal. It just means I like animal movies. And if you're in Los Angeles, uh, you know the one Homeward Bound, the old one from the early 90s? It had uh, Michael J. Fox, uh, Sally Fields voices. Well, my good friend Ben Thal was the kid in that movie. And Ben was like, hey, I got the director of Homeward Bound. I've got the El Capitan Theater from Disney. And uh, Saturday the 28th of January, in about two weeks, we're going to sit down, have a screening of Homeward Bound there. And, you know, for the, for the 30th anniversary, and we're going to have a QA. and a and, and guess who's hosting that Q&A? This guy right here, the host of Your Geekscape. So there's a lot going on. Uh, we're going to talk about it and more. So strap yourselves in. Let's get the show started. All right, Geeks Gabus, so let's get right to it. Uh, we got ourselves an awesome episode. Tom, um, I don't know what to say. Uh, I know we have about 30 shows here on the Geekscape Network. Tom does 15 of them by himself as far as podcasting goes. Um, the one that you want to check out is Daily Tech News Show. Uh, this is Tom every day talking about the most recent tech news. I know that is something that I don't cover a whole lot on the show. I talk movies, video games, comics, the pop culture stuff like the the easy stuff that you don't really need too much of a tech minded science minded brain to talk about. Uh, so to help fill in the gaps, I got Tom right here. Tom, how are you, man? Ah, oh, I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, so listen, I'll admit, all right. When you were solicited to Geekscape, I uh, said, absolutely. This sounds like just the kind of person I'd love to have on the show. Let me check out this daily tech news show. I start watching Daily Tech News Show and my nose starts bleeding because <laughs> it's in a language that am I just too dumb to this stuff it is you are so tech. And I, I also get that complaint sometimes when I go into like back issues of comics and start talking like, you know, inside baseball comic stuff. People are like, dude, 
it's inaccessible. Like I, the, the layman, it, no, 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 no. Uh, what's your passion with the tech news stuff? You have to kind of keep up with it every day, right? Because you because you talk about stuff that you talk about the previous episode or the previous thing. Like there there's storylines in the tech news world. Yeah, I, I hope most of the time it doesn't make too many people's nose bleed. Uh, we we try to play to all fields basically. Uh, so the, there'll be some some light stuff in there today. We were talking about how Gen Z folks want flip phones again. Apparently. That's like uh, on the rise. Is it because rise. they watch like Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul? And Better Call Saul takes place in like it's that nineties uh, nostalgia. And they're like, yeah, that'd be so yeah. sick. And the, everything nineties is back again. Cassettes, flip phones, the whole the whole ball of wax. Um, but yeah, I've been doing a version of a daily show about tech news since two thousand five, uh, when I started Buzz Out Loud with Molly Wood over at CNET. Uh, and then I did a version for Leo Laporte's Twit Network, uh, and I uh, went off on my own in 2014. So yeah, it's it's just something I enjoy doing is breaking down all the tech news every day and saying, okay, what does this all mean? Uh, and then trying to feed it to people in a way so they don't have to spend all their time busting through all of those articles and feeds and just give give folks the important stuff. No, I was being facetious about the nosebleed. I think that um, this stuff is amazing. Um, it's just... It, y'all are the insiders like you know what you're talking about and i think that uh me being just a pop culture four color funny guy uh some of this stuff is like y'all are talking about ai not just the way i experience ai i experience ai the way i said in the intro like oh i see a bunch of people in my facebook group doing kind of vanity pictures <laughs> <laughs> yeah doing all <laughs> right? the like, pictures those were hilarious a, yeah but, uh, it, did you do it did you did you no did you, no i didn't i didn't do the old man versions of myself either like <laughs> i mean i'm already halfway there so what's the point uh but remember <laughs> you just that, put in the photo and it's just your photo I, back I, you're like oh okay I, okay so I, I did something kind of mean when everybody started doing the ai vanity photos thing i I took a picture that somebody had painted of sloths from the Goonies and I put it up as mine. And I said, I, I don't know what y'all put in, but this is <laughs> what I got. And, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm gullible in a lot of ways. I'm not, listen, I'm already calling these people gullible. Listen, I will, I just don't know what you're going to give up in these apps, right? Like you hear those rumors that like the one that had the old version of you, like that was like some Russian developer who was making that app and they're going to give your information. Like, I don't know what boxes to check, not check when this stuff comes around. You know, I was one of the late adapters to TikTok and all that stuff. Cause it's like, Oh, the Chinese, this the Chinese, that like, do we really need it? I don't know. If you want to go retro with nineties, don't did have you, any of it. Cause by you the way, have it in the nineties. Did you see that UT Austin uh, has banned TikTok from its Wi-Fi networks? If you're on campus. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, it's not insane, but, uh, but yeah, you just hear those stories how TikTok in China floats educational stuff to their kids, whereas we get like the dumbed down version that is a lot of noise and influencer stuff. Um, so when it came, when I started seeing the trend of like doing these AI pictures, I just said, yeah, what do we, what do we compromise here? What do we sacrifice in doing that? And whose information and who, you know, our likeness is like, who, who, benefits, who, yeah. who benefits from that stuff? And maybe you're the person to help, assuage my fears or compound them when it comes to that topic like what's the story on all this stuff yeah it's those are the right questions to ask who's who's going to benefit and what are they going to do with my stuff uh is it audited is somebody out there paying attention to it where who's behind this is it a company i know is it a company i don't know what's the privacy policy and better to hesitate uh, then, then to put that stuff in there because there are a lot of folks who want to make money off of your data, uh, and until we get a better way to to manage data, your only defense is not to give it to them. So, what I did, I, I first of all, I did something similar to you where I put up like just bad fuzzy pictures of myself and My said like, oh, look, already it's, bad. It's my sense like, thing. Yeah, yeah. People, I already put up like it's like you're, okay, like. But then, I, then I wanted to space, try it, but, so I, okay. I just used pictures that were already out there. I'm like, they're gonna be able to scrape these off the internet anyway, so I'll use those. That way, I'm not giving something they. Maybe I made it slightly easier, but they could have got them anyway. Uh, I got some really hilarious stuff. And so I only posted the worst of them. You know, the one that made me look like like Bowie meets an Asimov robot and stuff like that. Sure. And the crab hands, the hands are horrifying. I don't the think I had these... hands in any but like one or two. Yeah, they but never got the them. hands right. Yeah. Have you seen people's hands? In, in my nightmares, yeah. AI things like they are, it's like, it's like crab claw people. 
Yeah. And no, it, I've, it's scary. I'm going to dream about them again now that we brought it back up. I've just gotten over it. <laughs> I think that what you did was smart because as somebody who's been on the internet for a long time, putting your face out there, doing multiple shows, I think that similarly, you do a Google show, uh, search on Jonathan, you get me and a children's book author. There's two Jonathan Lennons out there in the public sphere. And that's a good idea. Like take the pictures that are, can only already be scraped and, and put them in there. Um, what about the involuntary scraping of this information anyway? One of the things that, you know, I talked to a lot of comic book artists as a big comic fan and a former writer of comics. And a lot of my friends make comics. The idea that a lot of this artwork, uh, these amalgamations, mm -hmm. I mean, scraped illegally procured almost like, are they illegally procured? Like these amalgamations of artwork that's been scrub scrubbed off the internet and you still see like remnants of signatures and things like that. Like, that's that's yeah. not good. That's that's like just automatic piracy. It's 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 t it's a tough one because uh, it depends on what data set you're talking about. Uh, some data sets have said we only went and got things that had a Creative Commons license on them uh, and trained off of those. Others are saying if it was publicly available, we used it, but it was a fair use because it was turned into an algorithm number and then discarded. That your picture is not actually in the the machine. What's weird about it is that the machine isn't looking at your actual picture, but it learned from that so it can replicate it. So yeah, it might replicate a signature. It might replicate brush strokes and things like that. And what's the difference between that and straight up copying? Because it's it's not, it's modifying. One of the one of the principles of copyright and 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 such is that it's a fair use if you modify it. So does it modify it enough? Yeah. And what is the difference between that and learning from someone and saying like, oh yeah, I picked up the, you know, I was influenced by them. Does, does the machine get the same kind of credit that a human would get there? So I, I don't think we're at a point where we have an easy answer yet. Uh, but the lawsuits have started. Uh, Getty Images, uh, the big gun, uh, has put out some lawsuits against some of these like uh, Stable Motion and, and Mid Journey. Uh, there's a class action lawsuit that, that's happening out of San Francisco uh, with a bunch of artists who, who got together. And uh, we're going to see, we're not going to get the answer from these lawsuits, but we're going to see what the early interpretations are going to be, which will set the precedent for the other lawsuits. Um, I'm going to pause real quick. Our good friend Jack Knife. I've never seen him on the comments, but welcome. I uh, love these two guys. I've watched plenty of both of you over the years. Nice to see you talking with each other. Well, thank you. Oh, that's um, nice, Jack Knife. Yeah, he then says he then says Tom is too smart to be on this show. Stop. And Stop I, I play, that. Jack Knife, listen. I play a character, all right? I play a character for you. <laughs> me too. Friend. I don't know anything. It's all written I down. I play the character. <laughs> Uh, he says he used to be known as Bolt T. You probably lost that to an AI Bolt T. Yeah, or probably. You made somebody mad and they got you with the jackknife and hence the nickname. Um, so listen, I uh, first started learning about this thing during the whole, um, you know, everybody wanted to make an NFT. And then the NFT started scrubbing. And they're start they started selling these NFTs uh, that were calling themselves the Hellboy NFTs. Mm. And Mike Mignola, who had interviewed on the show before, creator of Hellboy, uh, a lot of these comic book artists who sell their stuff at conventions, they also have a lot of stuff up for sale on their, on their artist sites. They have to stop putting that stuff up because those things will get scrubbed, end up as an NFT, and then they'll get a takedown notice from whatever gallery the NFT is being sold on. So somebody like Mike Mignola, who creates Hellboy, created Hellboy, has Hellboy artwork up on his website gets a takedown notice from an NFT gallery because some, you know, bot scrubbed the, the Hellboy image off of his gallery, puts it as an NFT and he gets a takedown notice. Like that kind of stuff just felt like the worst case scenario of the wild, wild west when it comes to it. And that's when I kind of said, mm, NFT, not for me. Has any of that stuff cleaned up or been become regulated anyway? <laughs> well, or is that kind of not the point of, NF of NFT? Uh, the bottom fell out of the NFT market, so that helped. Uh, that definitely helped. Thank you guys for <laughs> not buying NFTs. In fewer the fewer people motivated to, to do something nefarious. <laughs> well, when all uh, they offered you was Bored Ape artwork, like the Mike Mignola stuff, and it wasn't even Mike Mignola artwork in a lot of these things. It was like a rendition of Hellboy that looked like a Bored Ape, and it's like... Thank you guys I, for not supporting that. I, I think uh, this reminds me the most. Uh, I don't know if you ran into this. 
uh, in the earliest days, and honestly, it still happens sometimes. They've gotten a little better. YouTube would send takedown notice. The bot on YouTube would send takedown notices uh, every which way. It was like a robot was just firing guns off. Uh, the best example I remember was uh, we got a video mail for a show I was working on that was on YouTube. Uh, we used the video mail in our show. Uh, and then because our show was uh, was in the system, it they sent a takedown notice to the guy who sent the video mail. Because what we asked them to do is upload it to YouTube and send us the link. And we're like, no, no, he's the original. You should be able to tell that. And no, we should be able to say like, yeah, we used it with his permission. It's not the other way around. Uh, so th that to me is what was going on with NFTs is you've got a system that just had not been road tested yet. Uh, and hopefully... Uh, if NFTs don't go away entirely, uh, if they do stick around, hopefully what happens is you get a system where the best galleries have a better system for telling what's original and what's not. And those nefarious ones that do all the scraping just get kicked out right away. You were starting to see some moves toward that in some of the bigger bigger NFT platforms in the towards the end of last year. One of the things that, as a filmmaker, really intrigues me is the idea of the counter piracy, right? That you would buy a film or purchase a piece of artwork, it's on a blockchain, it's nearly impossible to pirate in any way, and the distribution's locked in, right? Like, nobody's gonna walk off the Fox lot with a copy of X-Men Wolverine Origins if it's being edited and if the workflow is backed up on a blockchain. Um, because you just can't crack it, right? Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna crack the Avid and walk out with Wolverine. Um, can you imagine that guy ended up with a ton of years in jail because he walked out with Wolverine? Yeah. Of all the movies um that kind of distribution model i am intrigued by that okay uh let's say our good friend jason inman who's in the comments we'll pull his comment up here in a bit hey, jason. uh jason goes and he uh purchases a film or purchases a comic it's digital and it gives him a key and not only that it maybe comes with additional stuff maybe it comes with take it to an after party at comic con this and that i, I like that stuff where it's an event for, like ticket or it's your copy of this film and in that way i think the blockchain good the nft bad do you agree with me or is am i taking a shallow kind of approach to all this no i i think you're on to something the blockchain part of it is is interesting technology that can be put to a lot of good uses uh i i try to remember in 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 our long years of, of wandering through this internet wasteland that everything is copyable Everything on the internet is infinitely copyable. So if you're trying to stop things from being copied, you're probably going to lose. What you want to do is make access easier or harder and make proof indelible. And that's the part of the thing that blockchain helps, which is to say, let me tell you who did what. You can decide, humans, what to do with that. But the blockchain makes it really easy to have a secure record of what happened. And that's where things like, yeah, like a ticket that's like, oh, I've bought a ticket to this event and my blockchain proves that I'm the person that has it and that gets me certain benefits. I think that's really cool. I still think there might be a use for NFTs that people haven't figured out. I I haven't seen a lot of them yet, uh, but there were some where like, oh, you could buy an NFT related to uh, a hotel uh, and then you could you could easily transfer your hotel reservation if you couldn't go on the trip. I was like, oh, OK, that's a little better than hotel ownership or, or vacation ownership. Maybe there's something there. Um I, I think probably online gaming could make better use of them at some point because again, it's about the record keeping. So the NFT is a sword that you could use in multiple games uh, if that ever becomes you know something that people want. But again, yeah, you also have to have something people want, right? Yeah, I think that the cross-platforming stuff is something that Nintendo and Microsoft at least are kind of shaking hands on sony i think in that last lawsuit when all that flood of documentation came out yeah, yeah. people started saying oh sony's the one that didn't want to play with nintendo and microsoft but the second Fortnite hit the switch i think you were able to play with anybody who was already on the pc or the xbox versions i know because i played it for an hour got my ass kicked so thoroughly i never played it again uh everybody was already well ahead of me on it it's a bit intimidating when sure. you go into Fortnite and you're like oh cool this new experience and you've got these kids making digital Lincoln Lodge forts in like two seconds, like yeah, 
And I'm like, oh, okay, I can't play with anybody here. Uh, is there a beginner's shallow end of the pool kind of Fortnite <laughs> We're arena? senior citizens part of I, the Fortnite. I want the Fortnite arena where it's like Fall Guys. You know that game Fall Guys where you just yeah, have to yeah. make it to the other side of a map and you're like a gelatinous cube with a t-shirt? Yeah, like, yeah. That's, that's my speed. Like, uh-huh. It's like Wipeout, and uh, it's fun, and you look like Baymax from Big Hero Six. Like that is, and my it hides speed. your horrible eye to hand coordination behind those. <laughs> it's blocks. really fun. Uh, <laughs> I really got into that. Um, and I'm kind of buying my time until the next Zelda comes out, and so I'm like, okay, what what game am I not totally going to go deep dive into until Z- I'm just going to play a bunch of like cursory games until the entire world forgets I exist because I'm in high role for that next Zelda. Um, Jason Inman is a good, I, he says two of my favorite podcasters and two of the biggest smarties on the net for Tom, any theories or ideas on the biggest tech change you think podcasts will experience over the next hmm. 10 years. We've been in this almost 20 years already. <laughs> God, I say that out loud. Uh, we've been in this almost 20 years on the, on the podcasting stuff. And like you, we both did radio prior to podcasting. The next 10 years, what do you see the changes are and how can Jason get a leg up on them? Yeah, I that's a that's a really good question. And I think it, not to to just dial it back into AI because we, we brought that up earlier, but I think the ability to do things on shows, video, but also audio, uh, is is going to let you do have time to do stuff on podcasts that you wouldn't have had time to do before. Uh, stuff where you're like, well, I could hire an editor to collect the audio and assemble it and blah, blah, blah. You'll be able to put a prompt in something and say, uh, give me Nixon quotes related to baseball uh, in 10 second chunks and edit them together into a montage and it'll spit it out and it'll save you days and days of work. Uh, so I, I expect that stuff like that also being able to fix stuff where you're like, Oh, uh, can you just make me say 200 instead of 100 in that segment? And, and the, the algorithm can just go in your own voice. Have you say the right thing? There's, there's going to be a lot of time saving stuff. I think that's one of the big things that's going to happen over the next 10 years. I also think that show notes. Oh yeah. Like I had. Our good friend Fushna up in Canada, he hit me up and he said, hey, y'all kind of talk about sometimes on the show things that I haven't watched yet. And I want to kind of know show notes so that I know how to avoid topics that I haven't seen. First off, on this main show, Geekscapist, I don't spoil anything, Um, especially not. I mean, it's maybe a five year moratorium on that stuff. But I I keep like the Marvel specials and the specials you do with Ian for the, the deep dive spoilers. If you're downloading a Geekscape numbered episode like you're not going to get spoilers on that stuff you're going to get thoughts on it but you're not going to get spoilers um show notes i think are something that first off are still friendly for the google search you still kind of want to make show notes because the google algorithm will float you if you have a lot of the words up in there um but i mean just the time involved when someone like you or myself were making podcasts so regularly that show notes become a detriment. It's just like, who's going to make this stuff in time? Am I going to get a voice recorder to automatically transcribe this stuff and slap that up? Like, who knows? Yeah, it's it's, it's such a slog. And what we we took to doing was just linking to our show prep doc in the show notes. And like, here, here's everything we had going into the show. So now you've at least got that. The ability to like give chat GPT that and say, turn that into show notes. Yeah, that's going to be, I already know a few podcasters doing stuff like that. I've got a, here's my show notes. Geekscape, let me, let me bring you behind the scenes real quick. If you're watching this on video on YouTube, Twitch, or uh, Facebook, they're coming to arrest me for this. I'm, I'm like literally right on Burbank. So this happens. Uh, actually, this is the siren that Matt Kelly just added another podcast, the Geekscape Network. Um, well, these are my show notes, not digital. I'm pretty lo-fi. <laughs> yeah, and and speaking, speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of Jason Inman, Jason Inman and I talk about this all the time with screenwriting. Uh, he straight up uh, is horrified that my writing process starts in a notepad. And he's like, how? And I don't know. I, I feel like Charlie Day in that meme. I just have to see it on a wall and it has yeah. to be tactile for me. And I need to see all the pieces, be able to move them around. How often hands. do you use yarn? to? Yeah, right. <laughs> to connect them all. <laughs> I mean, they all end up. I mean, I don't know. They should end up in the garbage bin anyway. But uh, but no, I use the tactile stuff. I think that that's something that digital 
can't replace is is just the thought process of that stuff is seeing all one place on a wall yeah um until i get a computer screen the size of a wall i don't i think i'm going to stick to the screenwriting with the well, until, and stuff. until you can actually pull something off a screen and just carry it over and put it on another screen right which i have no doubt at some point they'll be able to do that maybe in the augmented reality or stuff? something like yeah. that but but yeah there's I, I still have that where like how do i get this to that device it's gotten easier it hasn't gotten that easy you can just pull a post-it note and put it somewhere else it's so easy no the closest i get to that is just air dropping my or like linking my notes on my yeah. phone to, right. it, to something and i just copy and paste it into it and that but no i'm, I'm pretty lo-fi and i, I kind of like lo-fi as well again like it's something that um I don't know. Do you still do you keep a handwritten journal at all, or is it all digital? Not really. I don't. I I I, I don't do any kind of journaling. Uh, but but I do. I almost feel guilty when I like use paper and write things down because I'm like, ah, I should <laughs> I should be able to do this with technology. But you're right. Sometimes you're like, no, it'll just work better if I can draw it out. And you can draw it out. You can sort of draw it out on tablets now. There's some some good, you know, uh, e-ink tablets that let you draw. But it's just so much faster still to just grab a piece of paper, do a quick sketch for something. You're like, okay, I'm gonna, I've got that going there with this and that. And your ideas flow better still that way. Especially in communicating with others. Yeah. In a collaborative medium like film, like you want to write it down, show pictures, show you what it looks like, mm -hmm. hold it up, put it on a screen. Um, Tom, where'd you, you grew up in Illinois? Is that yeah, right? I grew up uh, near St. Louis, Missouri, on the Illinois side of the river. Yeah. Okay, so I was, I think, down the I thirty five and a little bit east west of you in in Austin. Um, you have brothers, sisters. I don't, I really don't know anything about you, Tom. And it's crazy that like our audiences are like pointing to each other, like, hey, wait a minute, how did this <laughs> take sixteen years to happen? I know you, I know you. You know, you had a revision three show a couple years after I had a revision three oh, show. Sure, like, yeah. it's just like. Well, Wait, what was, was your revision I, three show? We we had Geek Drill. The first podcast was on revision three <laughs> back in 05, 06. And then we started Geekscape out of that. Um, right, right, right. What oh, wow, what is okay. what is yeah. your story? Did you you have brothers and sisters? Like what is this? Yeah, so what is I, this? explain yourself. I was born uh in Greenville, <laughs> Illinois. Greenville is uh -huh. a little farming town, a little soybean farming town. Uh my dad was a food scientist. I had an older sister, younger brother. Uh went uh, to University of Illinois because I got a scholarship because my dad ha had served during the Korean conflict. So I got the children of veterans of the Korean conflict scholarship at the University of Illinois. So I went to the University of Illinois. And when I got there, uh, I took actually back up when I was 16, my mom was teaching aerobics to the wife of the owner of a brand new radio station that had opened up in our town, little 3000 watt radio station. So my mom got me a job at the radio station. So I started working in radio at 16, just doing like evening shifts of country music. Uh, it was country music during the day and heavy metal at night. <laughs> <laughs> and this is early mid this is 86 is what I, yeah okay yeah when i started doing that uh and so i would do like a couple of country shifts for two hours after school covering you know a gap for them and then saturday nights when none of the metal djs wanted to work i would do the rock zone from eight to midnight on saturday uh and so when i went to the university of illinois i got into the college radio station there wpgu eventually became program director there for a couple of years, uh, went off to Austin because I was tired of being cold, uh, went to grad school at UT, worked at Half Price Books on Guadalupe oh uh, for six years uh, yeah. until I was finally like, I don't know what to do with my life. And a friend of mine had moved out to San Francisco and said, there are jobs falling from the trees out here. It's 1999 here. And she, she was part of the San Francisco Women on the Web email list but she would send me all of these uh, job listings from it. Uh, so I went, applied for three jobs, got offered all three of them and took the one at ZDTV, which is what it was called at the time, because it had radio, it had television, and it had the web. Uh, started as a web producer there, ended as the executive producer of the web, and then after Tech TV went to CNET, and then from CNET into all the stuff that I was mentioning earlier, podcasts and everything. But along the road, you're doing narrative fiction. You're writing as well. 
Yeah, I've, I've always liked writing stories, uh, e even when I was in high school. And so when e-publishing came along, I, I went right into it uh, and started uh, trying to get e-published. I got a book e-published on Rocket Book in like 2000. Uh, and then when, when print on demand came along, I, I took big advantage of that. Uh, and I've been publishing books on there quite a bit, as well as through ink shares, which is a kind of a more traditional publisher, but it does a crowdfunding aspect to, to getting public published as well. And those, uh, all, all that writing, Tom Merritt books com yeah, is that Tom where you can com. It? yeah Tom Merritt books com uh, I did a little poking around learning oh, yeah. about you the the main thing this daily tech news show dot com uh, as somebody who's been podcasting and doing radio and college radio going back to the nineties before that like uh, it's a similar kind of parallel the can we talk about the metabolism of creating that much content and generating that much work and really the relationships with your collaborators for that long like Geekscape is kind of Jonathan and then Matt does the network and mm -hmm. you know we have we have a ton of shows on here but um this one's mine like this one is mine and I have co-hosts in and out and you know collaborators and guests but um what kind of drives you to have that longevity of a career Yeah I I think I've I've always liked talking uh, I've, if you look at my report cards, uh, always the, the negative was he talks too much. Uh, and so I've, I've always enjoyed talking. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is sit with my grandparents and just chat and just talk about stuff. So I, that's one of the reasons I got into radio. And when podcasting came along, one of the reasons that I loved it, uh, I was lucky enough to meet some really good journalists at CNET, Veronica Belmont and Molly Wood, who were two of the, the, the people that helped start Buzz Out Loud. Uh, and we just had a great time doing it. Uh, I almost feel what I do now is a bit of a reaction to CNET people telling us we couldn't make a living doing podcasting because i would say like man if i could only do this like because we were building up that audience i'm like if at some point this this paid for itself and this is all i did i would really enjoy that and everybody was like there's no way you'll never be able to do that uh and so yeah i, I guess i made it my mission to prove them wrong uh well, at the same time radio hosts have been doing that and granted they have cbs and these major conglomerations the entire sure. history of radio and television this and that but you're watching them and saying hey like this is happening every day there are people talking for a living why not me yeah right oh, like, and, who are and those, also who are why, those not, heroes? why not a a podcast where where you you don't have to have the gatekeepers anymore you can just put it out there and it, it's a matter of getting the audience uh yeah it's it was a huge part of that and i was working for cbs after they bought cnet at the end uh mm -hmm. so, so i was i was working for that aspect of it when when i find when they were like yeah but we don't want that we i guess they were happy with the other stuff they had indirect discovery networks had bought revision three and they yeah, obviously yeah. are uh well they're figuring things out with our good friends over at warner brothers <laughs> but uh that company exploded they acquired a lot of things and they hit on a lot of stuff and it was all talk and the internet kind of gave that place. Uh, should everybody be doing it? This whole gatekeepers conversation, should everybody be doing it? The, the pandemic gave us, what, 100,000 million new podcasts? I think that's fine. Uh, if people are doing it because they want to. My, my advice to folks has been for 20 years now. Uh, if, if you have a topic you're really interested in and want to talk about it, then do a podcast, sure. Uh, if you're, if you want to get rich, don't do a podcast, uh, because I'm doing this because I just really enjoy doing it. And I'm lucky enough to have gotten into a niche where I can make it pay the bills. Um, and yeah, there are a few Joe Rogans out there who, who are, are raking in the dollars, but the, the slog to that, uh, it, it requires you to enjoy what you're doing for it to work. So you should start with enjoying what you're doing. I don't worry if there's like, ah, but there's a lot of bad podcasts. I won't listen to those. So it doesn't hurt me that there <laughs> are a lot of there. bad movies too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think the, the more shots we have at people trying stuff, the more interesting things we're going to get. And I think we've seen that. Yeah. I think for me, and I, 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 I love pop culture. I clearly talk about pop culture all the time. I see all those pop culture things. I read comics. I'm an addict. 
and I got to tell you, I lost a hundred dollars worth of comics over the weekend because the uh, lo yeah. local rains here in L.A. Uh, it never leak, rains in California. Right over there in the office, and um, I I'm came sorry back. for your loss. No, I came back from Thailand with a little bit of a surprise, and it was like, oh yeah, your comics um, have a leak, and you should have bagged and boarded them earlier. So that's my lesson. Uh, but I think more than pop culture, I think I'm just interested in people. Like, I think I, I like having people on the show. I, I don't think I could do. I've been listening to Rob Liefeld, who is, you know, he's you love him or whatever you think of Rob. Uh, he's a friend. I love Rob. I think his passion is unparalleled when it comes to comic books. I don't I can't I don't know of anybody who loves comics as much as Rob Liefeld. Um, what, regardless of what you think, there's no bigger fan of comics than Rob Liefeld. So I like listening to him, but he does a show by himself where he just goes. I don't think I could do that. I can talk long, but I don't think I could do that because I. I like people. Um, and it, yeah, he does too, but he loves comics. Uh, who were your heroes? Like, I mean, obviously you love tech. Uh, who are your broadcast heroes? Because so, somewhere you had to find like a barometer or people to take from. To Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as far as broadcast goes, uh, and, and this is a, a part of growing up near St. Louis, uh, pretty much anybody who worked for KMOX radio uh, in the seventies and eighties. So, you know, Jack Buck and Mike Shannon do the baseball games, probably the folks that most people out there are familiar with. Uh, but there was, you know, Jim White in the evenings, uh, and Carney in the mornings and, and all these, these huge larger than life voice presences at, at a time when, when talk radio wasn't, the the partisan entertainment zone that that it became in the 90s but but was the news it, it was like very in the tradition of edward r murrow and walter cronkite in that very serious like let's have a discussion about the issues of the day uh and all of them that entire roster uh on kmox as well as some of the radio folks uh on fm radio rick bayless at casey uh john Eulett at casey the, the 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 rocker radio in, in st <laughs> louis as well um and this is stuff your dad or your brother and your sister got you into kmox was just in the air everyone listened to it grandpa mom dad like if it snowed you got up and went in to listen to camo x to hear the school closings like it was just all of them casey was definitely my sister that that was the like you know you got to stop listening to hit radio here let me let me turn you on to something better than that uh and that 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 came from her i think that was the beautiful thing of like growing up in austin i had an older brother and he would listen to like the metal sh stuff and then you know megadeth and metallica and um you know slayer and all that stuff and, and that stuff was you know i was a little bit more of a wuss but when he started listening to the, the chili peppers i was like oh what are these guys you know what's this you know there's, there's a naked woman on the mother's milk album i this is kind of interesting but that immediately <laughs> led to green day like that stuff was mine. That stuff felt mine. My first tape was like a Billy Idol tape and I liked the pop stuff and the, the, you know, the stuff that felt like the Ramones. And then like I was telling you before the show, growing up in Austin, that stuff was everywhere. There was so much music sure. everywhere, indie music. And my third grade teacher, a guy named Mark Pratt's owned Liberty Lunch. And it was the only place I was allowed to go. And it happened to be an all age concert venue. So in 93, 94, I see Weezer. I see Green Day. I see all these bands playing small stages. And that kind of turned me into college radio like you. And I was at University of Pennsylvania. WXPN right there is on campus. And it's crazy that WXPN is one of the biggest public radio stations in the country, especially the Northeast with World Cafe. Like Letterman pulled a lot of his acts from World Cafe. Um, and our own podcaster, Matt Milligan of Weedus, just played the World Cafe, I think, Friday. Because Matt Kelly was at the show and it's i still miss that stuff I, I still miss music that way um and discovering music that way and i think that's just a sign of us getting older but obviously it's all about meeting oh, yeah, people man. There, there there's there's something about like i remember jeff alexander from the radio station i worked at in greenville uh took me to his house and was showing me his record collection and that's where i discovered like dead kennedys and sex pistols and and that kind of stuff there's something magic about those moments when you discover <laughs> those right like, what is this yeah what what is this and then you find the record labels and that's i mean the compilation cds in the 90s were really 
that was the stuff. And I don't think there Spotify is maybe like that, you know, with your daily mixes and things like that. But yeah. getting those compilations where you said, okay, well, I know this song, I know this band. And yeah. I'm guessing a lot of these bands are similar, but when labels would get put out a, a compilation a year, that stuff would go I mean, you'd you'd have to you'd have to get the albums for every band on that compilation because all that stuff was pretty much um related. Uh who knows where this goes? Can AI save us from that? I don't know, man. I'm still scared of AI. Was that all over CES this year? You tell me. Like, yeah, yeah. it was all over CES. Every, like everybody were, like, was trying ago. to say they were putting AI into stuff. So it was kind of hard to figure out, like, okay, do you actually have anything interesting in here? Um, but but yeah, there, there's a lot of people claiming, like, oh, we have an algorithm that does better upsampling to make the picture better or, you know, can can anticipate uh, your 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 needs, uh, you know, by by providing better recipes. There was a lot of kitchen stuff uh, that was trying to use A.I. We'll see how good it is. Uh, the the biggest news was Matter, which is a platform that's going to let you have all of your smart home stuff work with each other. So that if you've got Amazon Echo, it all works with that. If you switch to Google Home, it'll still work with that. You want to be on Apple? Fine, it'll work with that. Uh, and everybody was announcing Matter compliant devices, which to me was way more important and 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 much more useful than any of the AI stuff that I kept seeing. Wasn't that just the comic from Maxim Overdrive though? I was like, we're just gonna just the comment from Maxim Overdrive controlled all the machinery right there. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> well, the, the the difference between this and Maximum Overdrive is that you don't have to buy into the Maximum Overdrive <laughs> platform. That's like, the yeah. nice thing. Yeah, like, yeah. Maximum this, this... Overdrive was never matter compliant, Jonathan. That's the, yeah. It wasn't very compliant with anything. No, human, exactly. Basically. Yeah. Maximum Overdrive was like, oh, well, listen, this Mac truck's going to run over Emilio Estevez. You better figure <laughs> this out. Yeah. Uh, and, you couldn't I just think... say, you know, Alexa, stop. It would, it would Alexa, more. please stop. It's like you're going to roll over a little league team. Stop this. <laughs> um, speaking oh. of, of that kind of out of control thing we the, the out of control hive mind in a sense we we finally got this last of a show on hbo oh thank goodness yeah uh well you, you say things thank goodness and i agree with you the show i mean have you played the video games and you no. don't have to have played it's... the video games to <laughs> be a part of this conversation I'm, I'm from a small town jonathan so i was saving myself for watching <laughs> this show <laughs> well the thing about The Last of Us that I thought was incredible is Geekscape is if if we're, you've played the games or not, there's about 15, 20 minutes on the front end of The Last of Us pilot um, that is not in the game. And everything else is... I, I cannot think of a more accurate or a piece of adapted property that sticks so closely to the original material. The, the Last of Us pilot is is the game it's following the beats it's following the narrative uh down to the art direction this thing really strictly kept to the video game and the video game is incredibly cinematic like we know that about naughty dog games like um you know uh what was the the treasure one that tom holland and marky mark made the movie for um this is this stuff is is all pretty cinematic to begin with but craig mazin who's i know as a, as a writer he did uh, some projects as a, a director, I think he might have done an episode of Chernobyl for HBO, but that Chernobyl series is kind of where Craig kind of got the at bat for last of us. And they knocked this pilot out of the park as someone who's not familiar with the video games. Um, this first episode, like, what did you think? I know Jack knife on, on YouTube is saying he didn't play the video games, but he loved it. Um, yeah. I'm right there with you, with you, Jack knife. Uh, my, I, I do a show about cord cutting, you know, about watching TV without having to have cable subscription, which is now just called watching TV. But uh, we started it back when that was a revolutionary thing. And and my my co-host, Brian Brushwood, huge fan of Last of Us, has played both of them multiple times, loves it, was very nervous about this coming out. But the experiment was, I'm not going to play Last of Us. I'm going to watch this. Uh, and we'll be able to compare notes on that. And we both love it. Uh, I thought it was super compelling right from the start. Uh, I There were a couple of parts where I was like, oh, this scene where he's cut off by the wrecked truck feels like a mission. Uh, okay, this scene where they're running through the tunnel feels like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working a, a video game problem. But most of the time I wasn't thinking about it. I, I was just enjoying the story. 
Yeah, and a lot of those beats, including those two you named, those are narrative elements from the game. Those are those are portions of the game that they use to separate characters or yeah. to have you figure out problem solving. The the one in the tunnel in the video game is a much larger area in the game in which you have to avoid detection, but that's there in the in the show. And I thought the show was incredible. I think the performances are awesome. Craig Mason's direction on the pilot. Um I thought that stuff was great. Uh, Geekscape is if you haven't watched The Last of Us, I don't want to go too much further on it here. It's it's going to be the marquee show for HBO. Um, I think everybody's going to get in on it, and I love it. And hopefully it doesn't go the way of a lot of HBO shows recently. I think this is the one that they're going to keep. <laughs> I may say, like HBO, they definitely... Uh, <laughs> You know when they found them. You know when they got this new president, and they had to realign the the economics of HBO uh, and DC and all those things. Like they made a lot of hard decisions, and uh, they they had to, I think. And it's not a popular thing to say because people are like, "I want to see the Batgirl movie." Yeah, I want to see the Batgirl movie too. I want to see Henry Cavill as Superman as well. I think he's a fantastic Superman, but it's a major corporation that has a lot of responsibilities to their financiers and they were in like billions of dollars of debt. Those decisions had to be make it made in their hard decisions. Last of us house of dragons. I think that's what they're going to keep on HBO max. The other stuff, I think we're going to see reality TV and we're going to see major marquee TV shows. And I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of in between in that way. It's becoming a lot of what we see at the met at the megaplex. Like we're going to see the Marvel stuff. Don't think we're going to see a lot of the indie in between stuff. Yeah, you know, it's crazy that streamers have become this. On cut the cord. I mean, do y'all talk about this kind of yeah, tapestry uh, change? Absolutely, we we track it uh, real closely. And two things come to mind there. One is Discovery, Warner Brothers Discovery wants to make a free ad supported streaming platform. So some of the less premier stuff might show up on that when and if they launch it. But the other thing I've been following is. Uh, the talk, the scuttlebutt, it seems to be, and this is me going out on a limb, uh, sure. that Warner Brothers Discovery is polishing up, uh, cleaning up from when AT&T owned it, uh, getting it nice and tight and efficient, which is why they're cutting things and cutting costs and being so penny pinching in order to sell. Because in a couple of years, you have two big things happening. One is Disney is going to finally get to buy out Comcast from Hulu. And then Comcast will have a bunch of money and will not be bound to any of the Hulu agreements anymore. And Comcast is going to exit all of the provisions they had to agree to when they acquired NBC. And both of those things are going to happen around the same time. And there's going to be a bunch of consolidation, is my guess. Uh, and somebody, and I'm I'm almost certain that Warner Brothers Discovery is just you know getting all pretty, uh, so they can see who wants to invite them to the dance. They'll probably get acquired by somebody at that point. I would say that's no surprise. Um, and I think I think the writing's on the wall in a lot of those decisions. It, I mean, a leaner, meaner Warner Brothers HBO Discovery. I think that is exactly what everybody's seeing is happening. Is like okay, they're putting on a you know they're making sure they're nice and trim for the summer purchase session yeah um you know it might be the same over at our friends at paramount and viacom like viacom's yeah. been on on for sale for a while um what's nuts over at viacom is paramount uh, plus is going to be the home of this dungeons and dragons series and they're also the home um of paramount's also the home of the dungeons and dragons movie and I don't know if you Geeks Games remember back in 2008, I had the shows over at Fox that ended up on Hulu, the early days of Hulu. Um, the executive producer on those shows was a man named Gabriel Morano. He now works over at E1. He's in charge of the D&D &D stuff. And we had a nice meeting a couple months ago about all the plans of D&D &D that I will never talk about here on the show. But man, I will tell you that Gabe is bringing in the right people for Dungeons & Dragons. And there are people who love Dungeons & Dragons the approach to the movies and the TV shows that they want to do for Dungeons and Dragons, they're right. Like the barometer is correct. Like they know what they want to do and they especially know what they want to do in, in relation to things that I had never dreamed about when I was in high school, you went to high school, all the fantasy content that's out. Yeah. Like the fact that Dungeons and Dragons is popular, the fact that we have Lord of the Rings shows, the fact that we have Game of Thrones shows, the fact that like 
high fantasy. Maybe we're going to see a Dragonlance series one day. Like, that would be my dream. Wow. You yeah. know, like, I see Avatar, and all I can think is, like, why, how come nobody's made an elf quest yet? Because there you have a bunch of different, you know, tribes living in na- different forms of nature. Right. Like, what is going on here? But I think this day is upon us. And I got to tell you, that D&D announcement, seeing it in the same kind of home as the D&D movie, like... Maybe there's something there, but is it enough to save Paramount from a acquisition? I don't know. I think everything's for sale except Disney. Yeah. Well, and maybe even Disney. I I, I hear people talking about like, well, Apple might want to, you know, snap them up. I'm not sure I buy that Apple wants to be in any of those businesses, uh, but they could. Uh, and if they don't, I, I suppose somebody else has enough money. The the big the big ac- the big acquisition makers, the acquirers. That's the word. Uh, yeah. Amazon, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, or a- AKA Meta, uh, and Apple has cash if they want to. Microsoft, you know, not not bad. Uh, they're more concerned with gaming than they are with the other entertainment. But those are the companies they're going to be buying stuff. And Comcast, uh, and, and Comcast with NBC, you know, will just would just add things to that. Uh, Disney's probably going to survive on its own. Otherwise, everybody's everybody's on the table. I think you're right. Tom, how much of a canary in the coal, uh, in the coal mine is Sony with their entertainment division? And it's that, so weird the entertainment Sony, division's right? been yeah. like, I mean, that, this is a tech company, right? That um, without a Bond movie went pretty much dormant. Without a Bond or a, a Spider-Man movie, pretty much went dormant during the pandemic, and uh, and that affected the theatricals. Like you saw, Regal just say hey without a bond movie we, we're not doing anything stateside during the, the yeah, pandemic yeah. and a lot of this is well it's real estate play too right like like the disney shops and malls like who's in a mall anymore like you i don't know i with the sony thing sony feels like a canary in the coal mine that, that these tech companies don't necessarily want to start acquiring entertainment companies unless they end up with down the road with a situation like sony where you really need the tent poles to survive in, in the men in black never came back for sony bond and spider-man are kind of what they have and the tech company in japan is looking at sony stateside and saying how much longer are we going to put up with this stuff yeah so sony is so, so odd too because it's really a chip company i mean their their biggest money maker is camera sensors they're also a financial company because they they own a bunch of financial services uh stuff uh, and and so the the Sony Pictures Entertainment is is a part that they like, but they don't focus on. Uh, and I think they're happy right now having it make content for other people. They they mm-hmm. really don't want to to own the distribution. They're like, yeah, we'll sell to Netflix, we'll sell to Disney Plus, we'll sell to Hulu, we'll sell sell to Paramount Plus, whatever. Whoever wants it, we'll we'll sell and make the money. And I. Whether that's intentional or not, I think that's smart. I think it's smart for them to do that. Um, It's what MGM was going to do until Amazon bought them. And Amazon bought them not because they wanted MGM to be a distributor or or wanted the the MGM uh, platforms. They, yeah, they they wanted that library. Um, So I, I, I do think that it's... I don't know if Sony's a canary in the coal mine in in that respect, just because they're so unusual. Um, I think Netflix will be interesting to watch because they want to acquire things. They want to acquire content. That's why they bought Miller World. Uh, but then then they they hit the financial issues a little faster than they expected. Uh, so I think what they're trying, what they're hoping they can do is turn that video game service into the next Netflix streaming where everybody thought, Mm -hmm. why are you doing this until suddenly it was their entire business. I think they're hoping that becomes a new revenue stream that they can then use to buy all the other stuff that they need to. So that's, that's another one that I would watch. In the Miller world one is sad to me because I really, I was, I think I'm one of the people who enjoyed the adaptation of Jupiter's legacy. I, I'm, I'm, I I'll love say it. it, but I, I was <laughs> yeah, ready no, for another season. I was it, like, oh, really? Like, You're not? Okay. You know, yeah. it, it reminds me of what I thought of, uh, what's the other Amazon fantasy show? Uh, the Wheel of Time. Like, oh, that, yeah. first, that first Wheel of Time season, I was like, I'm down with this enough to watch the next Wheel of Time. Yeah. And stuff. they're making like, another one of those. Yeah. Yeah. But the Miller World stuff, like the Jupiter's Legacy, I was like, I'm, I'm into this enough to see more Jupiter's Legacy. 
not going to get it. I'm midway through Willow right now, and it's it's Willow. It's Willow. Yeah, that's Willow. What, I haven't started it because of that. I was all excited to start it, and then everybody's like, it's fine. Well, you know, for, it, did you like Solo? I did. It, from, the, it, from the people who brought you Solo is Willow. Well, it's yeah, trying to, okay. It, all it's, right. It's, Maybe it's I'll like it more than I thought. It's running it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. there's stuff that is like, there's times in Willow where I'm like, yeah. And there's times in Willow where I'm like, hmm. But uh, at a certain point, and I felt like this when I talked about Avatar two weeks ago, were we just complaining about cotton candy? Like, yeah. come on. It's, it, 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 I mean, can you imagine, like, my lawyer reps Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, and I'm like, and every time I talk to him, I say, Matt, like, what's going on with the dragon? Like, are they going to make uh-huh. a Dragonlance movie? <laughs> talk to me about Dragonlance. Talk to me about Dragonlance. Because, like, you worked at Half Pies Books, where I bought, like, a million fantasy books. You do a, a, this fantasy podcast, Sword and Laser. Like, you're a fantasy fan. Who thought in the million years during the 90s that we were ever going to see this stuff, Tom? Yeah, and here it is. Well, I I remember uh, uh, you know working at Tech TV and being like, they're making Lord of the Rings into a movie. This is crazy. And like, everyone thought it was the end of United Artists. Yeah, right. No, like, they, that was the Golden Compass. <laughs> uh, and then and then suddenly you know now it's like oh I guess Elric of Melnibene has got a deal. Uh, looks like we might see a series or like everything is on the table now. It's an embarrassment of riches. You're right. And did you enjoy the Rings of Power first season? Or are you hoping for a little bit of course correct on the second season? I I would have liked an edit. That 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 was my feeling. Mm-hmm. It's like there there just w- was a lot of time spent on stuff where I'm like, okay, I kind of know, and it's gorgeous, so I'm having a good time because it's pretty to watch. Uh, but I, I, I didn't feel the urgency that the movies, the Lord of the Rings movies, had, and I would like a little more of that sweep. Uh, and and moving things along a, a, at a at a better clip, I think. I think I agree with you in the sense that they were they were informed by the Peter Jackson movies, but also knew that they had to veer. They had they had to do their own thing. They had to kind of yeah. jam away from it. And uh, and narratively, there were a lot of misdirections that they had designed into the narrative that I didn't think paid off enough to warrant their inclusion but Mm -hmm. you're right the the pacing there's a lot of characters and uh sometimes we veer away from those characters for a long time and that affects the pacing and the urgency of some of the things that are going on like uh, is this stuff important or this not important character just because we need to pick up the pace if this is literally the end of the world type of scenario as i mean the stakes are always high in these high fantasy things like yeah. it is the end of the world a civilization as we know it the coming of this great darkness <laughs> every single one's the coming of this great darkness and i'm like okay well nobody's gonna be farming now but i still see farming like let's come on yeah, everybody yeah, yeah. let come on enough of this no 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 time for romance i feel like i feel like short round every time anybody has <laughs> you know, it's like anytime there's like romance in like something like rings of power i'm like whoa well, Oh, you were talking about the oncoming darkness and everyone being enslaved in, in, like into the dark world. Like, no, 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 no time for love, Doctor Jones. Yeah, yeah. Like, we, Move we along. Got a world Move along. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's funny. I don't know. That's that's kind of the it's kind of the way it is. With yeah, and then, and then there's unfair things that I felt like whoever can be Kate Blanchett, like that. That was just unfair to try to make somebody do Galadriel. I think I she did she a good. great job, but I kept unfairly comparing it to the the character that Kate Blanchett did. Uh, I tried not to as much as I could. You know what? I, there was a stretch that got away from my, my favorite character, Latino elf. I don't know the character's name, but he's Latino elf. And I like that representation. And I'm like, you know what? My elf is Latino. I like him. Where is he for an episode and a half? Come on, man. He's like my favorite character. Let's go. He clips. Uh, every time he's on screen, I'm digging it, even though he had a romance subplot. Yeah, but yeah. you know what? Um, it, that was, I don't know. So yeah, um, short answer. I, I'm hoping for a little bit of a course correction, but yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one. I think Wheel of Time is similar that I'm like, mm. okay, y'all educated yourselves on the first season. Yeah. I enjoyed the first season. Let's go. I'm again, I'm not, it's hard to complain about cotton candy and you know, Jonathan in middle school, whose face was shaped like the side of a locker because that's what it, that's what that was the way yeah. formed the structure of his head. Um, he, he's loving it. You know, yeah. it's like a, a, a you know, a middle of the road Marvel movie. He's loving it. 
<laughs> Some you know? of these like wheel of time, I feel like I'm I'm like, man, I don't really like raisinets, but I just keep eating yeah. the whole I, I can't the whole stop box. eating them. Yeah, I yeah. love it. I love it. I bought my Ant Man and the Wasp Quantum Manium tickets. Like, I don't know. Phase four, think what you will about Marvel Phase Four. I got those tickets so fast. I was like, let's go. Yeah, let's Sign me up. And then I'm gonna go to Norms with Jason Inman and I'm gonna talk about it. Nice. <laughs> That's what we do. Well, <laughs> Tom, great. I think we should invite you into the Norms Club. Hey, that'd be I'd, that'd oh, be honored. We, Jason lives near us. Yeah, you live near me, and uh, I think we should go to the Norms Club, talk some nerd stuff, talk some writing. You, we're all three writers, and uh, I don't know, man. I feel like we just t- maybe it's because I talk too much, but we dipped the toe a little bit on this podcast, and uh, but it's nice to meet you. Yeah, nice I to hope, meet you too, man. I hope the Geekscape is. Uh, I hope they go and seek out more of it um geekscape is the best place to, to do that and again this is a daily show that tom is bringing you uh you want to go over to uh dailytechnewsshow.com but tom also has his own website if you are into the uh narrative fiction stuff you want to go to tom Merritt books and for your normal stuff uh where we can find all the sources what's the website on that one tom Merritt.com? yeah tom Merritt.com collects everything all in one place if you just want to remember one thing that's the one to remember Okay, and Geekscape is that'll get you to the podcast, that'll get you to the shows. I mean, he's got a ton of podcasts, Geekscape is. If this isn't enough for you, and you're like, no, no, trust me, this is enough. If this, if this isn't enough for you, go seek out more of Tom's stuff. Um, Tom, thank you for coming on the show, man. It's been hey, so much fun to get to know this, you. This was a, this was a, a, a pleasure. I, I don't even feel like it, I'm working at all. This was just a fun <laughs> chat. Thank you for Wasn't having. that the goal, though, Tom? Yeah, exactly. I think that was the goal. This should not feel like work. Uh, Geekscape is you can find us anywhere you find podcasts. Geekscape. Search for Geekscape. You won't just find this flagship show. You'll find every show under the Geekscape umbrella. Uh, What have we added any shows recently? I'd need Matt Kelly back on the show to talk about. But I'll tell you on this one feed right here, Matt and I talk about the network on the show that we just had two weeks ago. And then if you go and dig a little deeper before that, you're going to find some really cool conversations. I had at LA Comic Con with people like LeVar Burton. Um... We had a podcasting panel with some of the podcasters uh, from this here network. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the feed, and um, there's going to be a lot more. So you're going to want to subscribe. And if you enjoy what you're hearing, share it with your friends. Tell them about Geekscape. Write that review. Reviews are always fun because I read them and I go, hmm, that's mean. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, but I five still like stars, it. still weird. <laughs> five stars. It, here's the deal you can make fun of me, but five stars. Let's do that. Five stars, but say whatever you want. Um, Love you, Geeks Gave us. Bag and board your comics before you end up like I did. And uh, next week, uh, I've got some cool guests. So if you're a fan of, um, uh, do I want to say this? I don't know. We'll we'll see. Geeks Gave us, you just want to be here next week, okay? Uh, Love you. And over and out. Donate, create. Peace.